I'm Jan Stafford, and uh, just like others on our team, I'm also a convert to the faith. Um, and tonight, when I was thinking about prayer and putting together uh, my thoughts on what I wanted to share about prayer, I thought about my Protestant upbringing. And prayer was a part of that. But I was much younger, and in that stage of life, uh, it was pretty much compartmentalized. It was prayer before meals, prayer, prayer before bedtime, and mostly prayer if I needed something really bad. Um, but that was, that was about it. I didn't really talk to God unless it was centered around those things. There was very little time to take to listen and to see what God was speaking to me. It wasn't something that crossed my mind. But as I've grown in my Catholic faith, I've been introduced to many other ways to pray. And one is the Lectio Divina that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And then Chuck, I think, uh, touched on it maybe a little bit last week. And I hope that you've had a chance to maybe spend a little time uh, reflecting and using that as you pray the scriptures. During our, our CIA, you'll notice and be introduced to lots of forms and examples of prayer. But always remember, it doesn't matter how you pray, what prayer you choose, the purpose is always the same, and it's to grow in your intimacy with God. Tonight, I want to share something that I found very helpful and have now included as a part of my prayer life. It's an app that's called Lectio 365. Some of you may have heard it or, or listened to it. My goal was always to spend some time with the Lord uh, before I began my work day. It seemed like whenever I stilled myself at 5 o'clock a.m. to read scripture and pray, I'd soon find myself thinking about what the grocery list was or uh, what was on the school schedule for the day. It was difficult to stay focused and difficult to um, stay in tune with God. Well, a friend of mine introduced me to this app, and now my morning routine is first to grab my cup of coffee, sit in my recliner, and get out my Bible and listen to the devotion and prayer for the day. It's the best 10 minutes I ever spend, and it changes the trajectory of my day. The focus of the scripture and how it's tied to my morning prayers becomes a conversation starter with God that I return to throughout the day. And it's these conversations that I continue that bring deeper intimacy with him. The longer I've remained committed to this morning routine, the more I've learned how to be still and listen and to find God's voice amid, amid the many distractions that I encounter. So tonight, for our prayer, we're going to pray together using one of the daily posts that uh, was, was on the app recently. And you've been given a handout to follow. Um, and this outline of the devotion follows prayer. P is prayer. R is reflect. A is ask. And Y is yield. And then on the last page of the handout, when we get to that, there's a closing prayer. And at that time, I'll ask you to join me, and we'll all say that closing prayer together. Help me to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all I do. Let me go back. Today is Monday, the 12th of September, and this week we are continuing to explore the life of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark and listening for his call to follow me. As I enter prayer now, I pause to be still. <laughs> 
to breathe slowly, to recenter my scattered senses upon the presence of God. Jesus, light of the world, as I follow you today, would you illuminate the darkness within me and around me? Show me your presence and your path as I welcome the light of your life. I choose to rejoice in God's love today, joining with the ancient praise of all God's people in the words of Psalm 5. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them sing joyful praises forever. Spread your protection over them, that all who love your name may be filled with joy. For you bless the godly, O Lord. You surround them with your shield of love. Jesus has been debating with the religious leaders, answering questions about paying taxes and marriage. Today, I'm reflecting on his response to what seems like a really simple question. Mark 12, 28 to 31. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Out of the 613 laws, which, according to Jewish tradition, are written in the Old Testament, Jesus makes his priorities clear. These two laws to love God and love your neighbor are found in different parts of the Torah. But this intentional connection demonstrates what needs to come first, love. Am I fully focused on loving God with all my heart, soul, and strength? Or is something else getting in the way? I pause to talk to God about this now. the neighbor I am called to love today. 
I take a moment to ask Holy Spirit to highlight someone I can share God's love with practically through my words and actions. As I return to the passage, I open my ears to hear your word and my heart to yield to your will once again. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Although Jesus was asked to name the single most important commandment, he actually chose two. My faith cannot just be private prayer and devotion. I'm also called to share the way of love with those around me. Jesus, I'm aware that what I identify as the most important thing isn't always the most important thing. Help me to walk in step with you today. And now, as I prepare to take this time of prayer into the coming day, the Lord who loves me says in Ephesians, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Father, help me to live this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help me to give myself away to others, being kind to everyone I meet. Spirit, help me to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all I do and say. Amen. And now, Father Terrence. Well, good evening, everybody. So I'm Father Taryn Whittington. I'm one of the two associates here at Christ the King, and it's great to be with you. I know I've been sitting in on classes. I've met some of you, others I haven't met yet, uh, but it's always great to meet a new RCIA class and to spend this time with you as you uh, discern. And so uh, I thought tonight uh, I would kind of introduce myself a little bit and then segue, I hope smoothly, into the presentation for the evening. And so uh, one reason I like to talk in RCIA is because like many people here, like uh, you, many we've heard from already, right, I am a convert. And so I didn't go through the traditional RCIA process, but I definitely went through catechesis and entered the Catholic Church as an adult, as a college student. 
And so I, I entered when I was a student at Hendrix in Conway. And that's been a long time ago now. It's actually longer than I like to think, uh, early 2000s. Actually, I think it's 2000, uh, exactly. And so, yeah, it's been, <laughs> it's now 2022. So uh, I'm almost to the point where I, I think, actually, I've reached the point now where I've been Catholic longer than I was what I was before. And what I was before was Pentecostal. So I know that's a bit of a step, right, uh, from there to being Catholic. And um, so one, one reason I like to talk about that at the beginning is because it helps, I think, to highlight maybe some of the, the differences between what we believe as Catholics and maybe what some other uh, churches believe. But not only did I grow up Pentecostal, but my dad was a minister. In fact, just retired like two years ago. Not even that long ago. I guess it's been like a year and a half, right? And so uh, he was a minister. He started, he became uh, a preacher when I was very young, uh, young enough that I barely remember a time when he wasn't. I vaguely can. And so I was born here in Little Rock, and at that time uh, he became an associate himself at a church in West Little Rock, what is now Chennault Valley, and back then was just the woods, basically. Right, <laughs> so it you know it was pretty it seemed pretty far out west in those days, and um, then from there we moved to Oklahoma. We were in Mississippi. We moved around, right? And so uh, I grew up as a preacher's kid, PK as they say in, in that uh, world, and I had one sister, and we you know lived in parsonages and really saw at close range what the life of ministry looked like, you know, which is why when I became Catholic, it seemed like a pretty intuitive you know question for me. Could God be calling me to the ministry? People would say that to me growing up. Oh, you're going to be a preacher one day. And I, I did not like that. I don't like that one bit. But I think probably, probably because I saw the responsibility. I mean, like just seeing what my own dad went through, uh, not that it was all bad, but there, it was very weighty, right? There was a lot of, you know, uh, discernment and hard work and, and trying to uh, shepherd people through really difficult times. I wasn't sure I would be up for that. Uh, but also because, well, you know, when you're growing up, you don't particularly like other people telling you what you're going to be. That's my choice, right? I mean, especially, you know, in our, you know, the modern world, you want to be your own person, right? And people were telling me, well, you're going to be what your dad is. I can just see that. I can discern that. And so that would always kind of make me recoil a little bit. Uh, but I guess they turned out to be right, but maybe in a way they didn't expect. <laughs> so, uh, but that's how I grew up. And um, when I became Catholic, you know, one of the things that drew me to the church uh, is part of what I want to talk about tonight, and that is, I got into college, I wasn't really churched at that point, so we moved back here to Arkansas, uh, where most of my family had always lived. We were down in South Mississippi, kind of close to the Louisiana border, Brookhaven, if you know the area, and we moved back here, and I, you know, of course, graduated high school, went to college, and I became, you know, in my kind of wandering phase, not really attached to any particular church, but nevertheless still thinking a great deal about Christianity, the history of the, the religion. Well, what exactly was going on in all of those hundreds and hundreds of years between the time that you know, Christ walked the earth and the disciples were sent out, the time of the early church, which you hear a lot about in the Pentecostal world, as you would, for example, in the Baptist world. What happened between that time and, say, the 20th century? When you come from a church that hasn't been around for a very long time, I mean, in my case, you know, the Pentecostal tradition goes back to maybe the 1920s. You know, it's not very long ago in the scheme of things. You don't really have much of a sense of what happened in that sizable gap, right, between the time of the apostles and the time when, you know, whatever revival movement started the church we belong to, right? And so I've, I've always enjoyed history. You know, big reader, so I began to read more and more about that. You know, I, I was, you know, then curious about philosophy, and I went on to study philosophy there at Hendrix because a lot of what I was interested in in the, in the Christian tradition led me to people that, frankly, I couldn't understand on my own, right? People like St. Thomas Aquinas, people like St. Augustine. I wanted to take classes to begin to delve more deeply into that. And so that naturally brought up this, I, you know, question of tradition, Right, that there is this long church history that includes both an intellectual dimension, right, the, the history of all the, this thought, a, a mystical tradition, the history of spiritual writers, St. John of the Cross I read, also probably didn't understand very well. Right? I read him, St. Teresa of Avila, which is kind of a bit scattershot, going to the library and just pulling stuff off the shelves. 
but it all seemed to point back to this Catholic direction. And I felt very drawn to St. Joseph's there in Conway. I'd kind of go out of my way to pass it. Uh, you know, it just it was a kind of a, a draw, a tug in my heart. And so um, there was a great deal of richness there. But growing up as I did, we were told, as, as is, is often the case in non-Catholic churches, and maybe many of you have had this experience, that tradition is kind of a bad word, right? There's the Bible, and then there are the traditions of men, as people often put it, right? Quoting scripture, to be sure. There are traditions of men that have sort of come to, like barnacles on the ship, right? They are, they're accretions that are non-biblical that need to be cleaned away. And the story you often hear, of course, of the Protestant Reformation is that was one example of sort of scrubbing away all these things that attached to the church, attached to the Christian faith, that were extraneous or in some cases perhaps even contradictory to the biblical faith. And so tradition definitely was not appealed to. If it came up, it was usually in a negative way. Right? And so to begin to think of tradition as a source of faith is one of the divine sources of what Christians believe, well, that can be a bit of a challenge at first. And so I want to talk about that tonight. Some churches maybe are less uh, opposed to the idea of tradition than others, uh, and I'll be interested to hear kind of what your experience of that is. But for those who kind of come from churches where the bias is strong against the idea of tradition, I hope to be able to lay out pretty clearly uh, what it is that we believe in the Catholic Church that tradition is, why it's important, why it's an incredibly rich treasury to have as you, you delve more deeply into your faith. So why don't we go ahead and we can begin the slides here. I'm not much of a PowerPoint person, by the way, so this is kind of like just to help me not to forget stuff. And you have a picture to look at. <laughs> so as you can see, pretty basic, all right? <laughs> I see all these other PowerPoint presentations that are really professionally done. I'm like, well, one day maybe I need to sit down and learn that. Um, by the way, one thing that I do, I talked about studying philosophy at Hendricks. I also teach philosophy uh, to the seminarians in addition to being here at Christ the King. So I'm associate here, but twice a week, Tuesday, Thursday, I drive across town to a place called the House of Formation where the seminarians, most of them begin when they enter the seminary. And when you go into seminary, you study philosophy for a few years. Philosophy, by the way, can encompass more than just the subject of philosophy. Like they'll also study other academic subjects get their degree before they graduate to theology, which is out of state, right? St. Minor up in Indiana is where I went. We have a couple of guys from this, well, one guy from this parish in Washington, D.C., along with another seminarian from a, another part of the state. And so I go over there and teach philosophy, and um, I don't use PowerPoints there either much, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I almost kind of, kind of forgot how, how I brought up the subject. Oh, yes. So... Um, Anyway, the uh, um, philosophical tradition, you know, it kind of, as I delve more into that, I end up studying it. I look back, I got my PhD in it from Baylor, and I look back and think, what were you thinking, getting a degree in philosophy? What were you ever going to use that for? You know, how did, why did your parents even let you do that, you know? And in fact, um, you know, I kind of, even after I earned the degree, I got a job teaching it. I still kind of wondered at times. But then, as I discerned the call to priesthood more, which I had been doing for a while, uh, I discerned with an order out in California, and one thing that drew me to them was that some of their priests taught. I thought, well, okay, I can use this degree. Uh, so I went out there. I was in uh, Berkeley, uh, not in the university, but just in a house of discernment on, near the campus for about half a year, and I uh, felt God calling me back here, and I thought, well, I certainly won't use my philosophy degree as a diocesan priest in Little Rock. I know that, but I, you sacrifice what you have to sacrifice. And here I am, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's nice when you can see providence at work in your life. Uh, it, it, but, yeah, that, that was definitely not something I expected to happen. So, tradition. Tradition is one of those things that, it's not just fundamental to the Catholic faith. Tradition is really fundamental to human life. Human life is really built around those things that we receive from others. In fact, I think a lot of what ails modern society is that tradition has grown so thin for so many people, right? Most of us, if you grow up in a family, you receive family traditions, you receive stories about your parents and your grandparents, your you know, pumpkin bread recipe, whatever it may be, those things that give you a sense of continuity, right? 
that you can say, this is who I am. This is the identity I've received. I mean, I kind of got that too, even though I've rebelled against it a little bit. You know, oh, my dad's a preacher, you'll be a preacher too, right? I mean, we do also struggle as human beings to define ourselves. That's normal. But there's something that hedges us in about growing up, knowing you know, our, our, our national heritage, the city we're from, all those sorts of things that can add texture and richness to life. And fewer of those things exist for a lot of people now, I think. You know, it's the nature of modern life. You're hyperactive, moving around a lot. People sometimes have uh, fewer family connections than they would have had in the past. Fewer things passed down to them. And so in the world at large, I think there's been, like I say, a thinning out of tradition that leaves people feeling adrift. But I think we still know that even if it's less than it used to be, that what we receive and is passed down to us is very important. In fact, the word tradition just comes from the Latin word, tradere, to pass down, to give, to hand over. And so we have all these lowercase t traditions that, you know, really kind of shape our world, whether it's something as basic as, you know, eating turkey at Thanksgiving, right, gathering and opening gifts at Christmas, uh, birthday parties, all those sorts of things. And so it isn't really surprising then that the church, which after all is, yes, a divine reality, but also a human one, would have its traditions. The church is the family of God. It too has those things that are passed down, that have been handled and loved by generation after generation after generation, and now it's being given to you. The difference is that now we're talking about uppercase T tradition, right? These are sacred traditions uh, that are also the source of faith, right? But nevertheless, we can see how it's comparable to those other traditions that make a home for us in the world. Well, they make a home for us in the church, too. And you begin to see the connectedness between your own life here in 2022 and what somebody prayed, what somebody believed, and the devotionals that were practiced three, four, five hundred years ago and beyond, right? And so uh, I think if you begin to think of it in that way, it's not too surprising that, well, like I say, in the church I grew up in, we'd only been around since, I don't know, the 1920s, I think it was. Uh, and so there weren't as nearly as many traditions. But although there was a bias against tradition, truth is there were traditions, right? Because you can't have a continuous human you know, institution of any kind uh, that doesn't pass down things, right? That are, in the end, human traditions that have perhaps uh, proven to be beneficial to previous generations, and so they continue. I mean, I can name a few that would be in that church, but not in the Catholic Church. One would be, you know, just kind of almost picking off the top of my, you know, my head here, you're not supposed to gamble. Gambling's bad. We would never go walk into a casino growing up in the church that I did. I still tend to think it's not great, by the way, but that's just my opinion. You don't have to take that as gospel truth. <laughs> so uh, I, I guess it kind of stuck with, in my case. But th you know, that was just considered to be, to be wrong. And, and is there a biblical warrant for that? As far as I know, there's not. Let's hope not, because that would really throw bingo into chaos in the Catholic Church. <laughs> but I don't think there's anything about not going to casinos, not that they existed, in the Bible. But that was very strong. I mean, even to the point that there were some stricter people, I didn't grow up with this, who wouldn't even play cards, much, even if money wasn't involved, right, because it was just too close to gambling. Uh, not supposed to drink alcohol. Now, that's a lot of churches, right? Uh, Baptist church, lots of churches teach, should never touch alcohol. And, of course, the Catholic would agree that, yeah, I mean, being drunk is bad, is a sin, right? Abusing alcohol. But throughout Scripture, people seem to drink alcohol. I mean, the first miracle was where? Wedding at Cana, right? <laughs> Lots of big jugs of wine involved in that, right? So, but that was, you might say, a tradition that was, although they wouldn't like to put it this way, extra-biblical, right? And, and it's thought that there are bad reasons for it. You know, the abolitionist movement began... Uh, as a way of fighting back against alcoholism that, you know, was leading to uh, domestic uh, problems, you know, men coming home from work, uh, they stopped by the bar on the way home, maybe worn out from a hard day at the factory, and, and, and could lead to problems, right? So in the Methodist church, I believe it was, there was this movement, right? You can see why people had their reasons for it, they passed that down. There could be other things, too, that are not as morally charged as those two examples. Just the order of service. You go into a service, they say Pentecostal or maybe Baptist as well, and they don't just make it up. They don't reinvent the wheel every time they, they gather. 
right? There are way, ways in which things are ordered. You start with some music, then you have maybe testimonies, that's a thing, you know, and then you move on to a sermon, and then maybe you have an altar call, right? There are all these things that you know, get passed down. And it's not because it's laid out in the scripture as such, right? And so I think it's kind of an inescapable reality. Uh, the difference is that, well, it becomes something that we're very aware of in the Catholic Church and that we take very seriously as a rule of faith that is, can be, we can point to and say, this is sacred tradition, this is important, it should shape how we understand what we believe. So let's kind of have a couple of scriptures here, which I'm sure you've read already. But, um, so um, we, uh, we have here uh, Mark, you leave the commandment of God and hold fast to the tradition of men. This is a very commonly invoked passage uh, against the idea that tradition should be formative of our faith. And so people talk, point to Jesus criticizing the traditions of the Pharisees. Now, does that mean Jesus wanted to drop all of the traditions of Judaism? I mean, talk about a religious tradition that is chock full of traditions. The faith of Israel was certainly that. But what was happening was that some of those traditions were being taken and used kind of as power plays or maybe to flatter the vanity of the people involved. I mean, anything good can be taken and, and, and used badly. You know, we know that, right? And so the Pharisees were very much like that. Uh, we, we know that from Jesus. At least a lot of them were, right? And so he talks about wanting to, you know, basically fixate on externals as a way of trying to prove how holy you are. Lengthen your tassels, widen your phylacteries, you know, the little boxes they wore on their heads. Try to exaggerate a lot of this as a way of maybe filling a spiritual void, and also a way of putting yourself at a distance from the, the, the common people, right? The Pharisees definitely saw themselves as spiritually uh, superior to the people they were supposed to, uh, you know, uh, minister to. And so these tra the traditions can indeed, in, so, in some cases, become a barrier to the transmission of faith. It can become a barrier to charity when it becomes a way of badgering people making them feel they're not good enough, right? And so there you know, are traditions that can, over time, change, alter, or maybe even disappear, should that prove to be the case. And that certainly is what Jesus was criticizing the religious leaders of his time for. He participated in traditions of the faith, too. His parents took him to the, be presented at the temple. He went and read scripture at synagogue, as other people did, right? All of those uh, ancient traditions of Israel, Jesus participated in, as you know, as a faithful Jewish man. Uh, but he could see problems as well that could arise from the traditions of men that were not facilitating faith. Then we have this other uh, passage, uh, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. Right, so this gives us, you know, we have what Jesus says, a contrasting uh, angle. Right, where you have to remember the disciples, uh, they're going around preaching to these early Christian communities, and did they have a New Testament to present to them? No, right, it had not yet been written. <laughs> right, the Gospels had not yet been written. Letters are being written, which will later be included in the canon of the New Testament, but there's no canon of the New Testament. Right, Jesus, when he ascended, did not hand the disciples a canon of Scripture and say, this... This is the self-evident instructions about what you were supposed to do, right? Read this and you'll know what to do, right? He sent them with authority that he gave them to preach, to preach uh, and, and to, to become the body of Christ on earth, right? And so here they are preaching and what you know, people were being told about Christ, what they're being told about the truth of his life and his message, the resurrection, his death on the cross, all of that, they're hearing it orally, right? It's being told uh, by these people who are commissioned and given the authority of Christ to go out and spread the gospel. And so people have to remember that they do begin writing it down, but originally this would have been what we call an oral tradition. Right? And so that's what's being referred here to here. Right? Keep in mind what we've told you, the traditions that we're giving you. And um, so, I mean, one of the, as we read in uh, Trent Horn's book, and speaking of the canon of scripture like we did last time, and great, great talk, by the way, it was, it was fascinating, um, all the uh, information about the formation of the, what we know to be the canon of the Bible. But one of the, the most obvious traditions is the canon itself, 
right, that did eventually evolve into what we have in front of us right now. Or as uh, Chuck said, the, the one thing that you won't find in Scripture is the table of contents, right? It's been, at, you know, it's at the front, right? But that is something that the church gathered, and there were debates about it, discernment, and eventually you get the canon of Scripture. And some things that might seem like they ought to be included, if we, or seem like they would have been included, are, and other things that maybe we wouldn't have thought would be included are not. Right? And so what does he say? That there's a third letter of John that doesn't mention Jesus. And, but then why not include the Didache, which, has, you know, which was a popular uh, document among the early Christians. It shows the order of worship that early Christians followed, including the Eucharist and the proclamation of the word and homilies and all of that. Well, this is part of the church's authority, right? Is to discern these things and to use its authority to teach. One way it uses that authority is to provide the canon of scriptures that came out of councils and to give that to the people, right? To, to, to include that in the liturgies as part of, a very important part of how uh, the church transmits the faith, right? But it would be kind of hard uh, to, I think, to separate the scripture then from the tradition that gave rise to it. It's one thing that's passed down, right? Now, scripture and tradition are, are two sources, right? But, but Horn's uh, point is that we can see how within the history of the church, this comes to be what we recognize now as the Bible. So here we have that. Three, there are three pillars of the faith. There's sacred scripture, which we heard a great deal about last time. And sacred scripture for the early Christians still mainly meant, right, the, the, can't, the, the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, right, and the, uh, the, the various canons that were in place at that time, right, the Septuagint. And so um, that, that, that's referenced, you know, we think, think of uh, Jesus on the road to Emmaus, right, you're familiar with the story of Jesus on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection, he's walking, or two men are walking away from Jerusalem, and they are in despair, or at least they're very discouraged and perplexed, because they saw Jesus die, and now they're hearing reports that other people have seen him alive. And what does Jesus do at the beginning there? Well, he begins to open the scripture for them and show how his life, death, and resurrection was prefigured in the Hebrew scriptures. And their hearts burn within them. Afterwards, they go in and they break bread and they recognize him in their midst. This is the order of the mass, right? Scripture and the breaking of bread. We hear about Christ, we hear his words, but then encounter Christ in person, if you will, in the breaking of the bread. They recognize him and he vanishes from their sight. Right? But what Jesus is doing is he's, he's giving us the model of how we approach scripture, that the Hebrew scriptures were foreshadowings. They were, uh, uh, there's a typology there that can tell us who Christ is and how he fulfills ancient prophecy, how he fits within this overall framework that uh, the Christians inherit from the Jewish faith. And so we have scripture, then we have alongside tradition, the magisterium, which I think, does a magisterium have its own day? Is that a, a, a subject uh, uh, that you'll be discussing separately, what the magisterium is? No, okay, well, I'll talk a little bit about that then. Okay, so tradition then will be, you know, those ways in which uh, the faith is transmitted through the centuries, right? The devotionals that people, you know, uh, find to be uh, beneficial for uh, you know, spiritual growth, right? One of the, the most popular traditions that you'll see and probably already have seen, for example, would be like the rosary, right? People praying the rosary, all the, the popular, uh, popular prayers, and these things that are useful for transmitting and deepening the faith of people of God. And the magisterium is the, the bishops in union with the Pope uh, who are the ones responsible for formalizing at councils, for example, ecumenical councils, for formalizing doctrine. So the, the, the hierarchy, if you will, of the church is the magisterium, the teaching authority of the church. And so again, when Jesus sent his disciples out, he gave them his authority to teach. Why, why would somebody like Peter, and then later Paul and others, what gives them the authority to proclaim the truth about Christ? Well, they received it. It's not an authority they could give themselves. Right? Authority 
even just in the secular world, has to come from someone, right? It's something that is also passed down. And so that authority is passed down from Christ to the disciples, and they then are able to go out and to speak under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And they also have the authority to ordain, by the way, right? And so uh, people don't ordain themselves, which is a bit of, this kind of gets us into apostolic succession, which I assume will probably have its own day. But, you know, you don't ordain yourself, even in other churches, that's not a thing, right? You receive that from someone else. But it had to be received first from the source, if you will, from Christ. And those who receive it from Christ then have the authority to act in Christ's name and ordain others, right? And you have this long you know, line of going back from, from the disciples through all the bishops. This is another example of the continuity of the church over uh, long periods of time. So let's just read what the Catechism here says. The sacred tradition and sacred scripture are both closely bound together and communicate with one another. For both of them, flowing from the same divine wellspring, come together in some fashion to form one thing and move toward the same goal. Each of them makes present and fruitful the church, uh, in the church the mystery of Christ. Right? So uh, then there's also uh, in the Catechism, we're told at 97 in the Catechism, that sacred tradition and sacred scripture make up a single deposit of the word of God. And that's kind of interesting because we think word of God, we might think narrowly of the scripture. Right? Obviously, we also think of Jesus Christ right, as the eternal word of God. But here we're told that sacred scripture and tradition make up a single deposit of the word of God. In which, as in a mirror, the pilgrim church contemplates God, the source of all her riches. When we look into the traditions of the church, those that are sacred traditions, those that have held, what we see is God. Right? It's not just there for its own sake. Right? Just like when you look into the traditions of your family, you're seeing something larger than yourself. Right? You're seeing what's been passed down in this community that we call family. But here, you have to heighten that quite a bit because you look into it, and we're not just saying, oh, we're this community, and here are the nice things that we have as customs and traditions that hold us together, but it points us upward to God himself as in a mirror. We look in the mirror and see that as the body of Christ, the church, we are indeed a mystical reality, God working in the world. And so it says, the church in her doctrine, life, and worship perpetuates and transmits to every generation all that she herself is and what she believes. And thanks to its supernatural sense of faith, the people of God as a whole never cease to welcome, to penetrate more deeply, and to live more fully from the gift of divine revelation. One thing that you'll, you'll also um, hear about in our CIA is that there were traditions of faith that were not until later formalized as doctrine, like the Immaculate Conception, which I assume will also have its day. The Immaculate Conception was widely believed, going way, way back, right? Had not yet been stated by a council as a doctrine, but it had, the, as it says here, uh, thanks to the supernatural sense of faith, that sensus fidei in Latin, the sensus fidei of the people of God is maintained. Eventually, it comes before the church as a question for a council. And the church formalizes the Immaculate Conception of Mary. It didn't come out of thin air. It had been there with the people of God, right? It was part, the part of their faith. And so this, these things are also passed down. And then, of course, now it's a doctrine, holy day of obligation, all that. So the, then finally, the task of interpreting the word of God authentically has been entrusted solely to the magisterium of the church, that is the Pope and the bishops in communion with him. We could also say an additional thing here, that how we read the Bible, if we re are reading it well, we read it from within the tradition. Now one of the you know, issues with uh, the doctrine of sola uh, scriptura, you're all familiar with the phrase sola scriptura, the Bible alone is what it means in Latin, right? And so this was laid down as one of the fundamental principles of the Protestant Reformation, the Bible alone, along with faith alone, right? Sola fide. And so Sola Scriptura would say, well, you know, this mediating institution, the church, we don't need that, right? We can simplify. We have the Bible, you know, straight to the source. You don't need a bishop, a priest, 
uh, you know, a magisterium to tell you what to believe from this book. There, and it is self-explanatory. Now, I don't know if it, many of you have delved deeply into Scripture. You found it self-explanatory at all times. Well, <laughs> I don't always find it to be so, all right? And so what happens, of course, is that within the Protestant world as well, you end up with quite a few different interpretations, unsurprisingly. Just like if I went to one table in this room right now and gave you one chapter in Scripture to read, there might be slightly different interpretations for as many people as at the table, right? Because the Scripture is often difficult. There's ambiguity. There, there's a lot that, you know, requires interpretation. And so we have a rule. In tradition, we can read the Bible within the tradition. It doesn't mean that there are still a variety of interpretations at various points, because the tradition itself is big, and what St. Augustine said may be rather different from what St. Bonaventure has said about a Scripture passage, right? The Church Fathers, you know, they could be kind of all over the map, right? So it's capacious. It's not, it's not a narrow, uh, constraining, interpretive, uh, you know, key, but it does allow us to read against what has been thought before. I don't have to just open the scripture and figure it all out on my own. I can go back. Well, what did St. Augustine say about this? What did St. Thomas Aquinas say about this? St. John of the Cross, whoever it may be, or someone as recent as you know, St. Uh, Pope John Paul II, right? What did they say? And know that you're within the bounds of what uh, the church is, you know, supports. Right, even, even as you can explore and, and, and really, uh, you know, there, it's inexhaustible what all is out there. And so scripture then, uh, we have then this, this, uh, this the rule that we're able to hold up and uh, to then at least, you know, there's not, there's not a different understanding of scripture for every single person sitting in, in the church, right, where you get fragmentation. But there instead is a richness that nevertheless is productive of unity, right, within how we understand the, uh, the Bible. So sacred tradition about, yeah, we've read that already. Okay. One, one thing I, I like to, to look at or, or to refer to uh, is St. John Henry Newman. Uh, John Henry Newman was a, an Anglican uh, pastor, an Anglican priest in 19th century England who converted to Catholicism when that was a really controversial thing to do in England, right? And England has not been particularly friendly to the Catholic faith uh, in, in the past, right? And so at that time, it wasn't. And he was a high-profile man. He preached at St. Mary's Church in Oxford, which is a, uh, to this day, a pretty high-profile academic church, was a brilliant writer and thinker, very well regarded, and he became Catholic. He went over to Rome, right? Swam the Tiber. He was part of an Anglo-Catholic movement uh, you know, in, there at Oxford, uh, that they were kind of reintroducing some of the traditions of the, you know, the, 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 tradi the historic church, as they would say, right, into the Anglican tradition. Things like, you know, uh, holy water, crucifix, uh, prayers to saints, teachings about purgatory. And let's say some Anglicans, there's high church Anglicanism, but even there, yeah, people get a little uncomfortable. It's getting a little close. You, 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 you can kind of see the Vatican off in the distance there, you know, getting, getting, and so people got a little nervous about that, and then when Newman converted, like, it confirmed their worst fears, that this is just tiptoeing right up to the line, right, and so, but he did, and uh, he, he wrote his apologia about his life, he's, he's, he's a, you know, some of his writing can be quite dense, uh, but he's a really wonderful person uh, to read, especially his, his homilies, he was a great preacher, uh, but what he said was that we look at the church as it existed in the first centuries, and we look at the church as it existed in his lifetime, they do look rather different. You know, think about how the Catholic Church would have existed in John Henry Newman's time if he'd gone to Mass. It certainly looked different then than it looks now. All in Latin, uh, there's the, you know, the ornate quality of it, uh, the, the art, you know, the, all the things that people associated popularly uh, with, uh, with Catholicism. But he says it's like looking at a picture of yourself when you were a child and looking at a picture of yourself now, or looking in the mirror now. Rather different. But you can see that it's the same person. Traditions are authentic when we can see that, yes, this developed, this is different. We don't read about the Immaculate Conception in the New Testament, right? We don't read, purgatory is not explicitly invoked in the New Testament, 
But the question is, is it nevertheless a valid development of what we find there? Does it, does it follow from what we read in the Gospels, from what we read in the Epistles? And that's what the thing about the church. It's a living reality that's continuing to draw out the implications of the Gospel. And that's part of what we mean by the tradition. If it doesn't fit, if, it, if it's contrary to what has gone before, from what we find in Scripture, and, the, and then, of course, as the church goes on in the tradition, then something there is amiss. And that's a bad sign that this is not simply a legitimate development, but is a discontinuity, a break. And that's when a red flag goes up. That, no, this, this cannot be right. And that sometimes is why councils get called, right, to, to settle controversies. Well, there are people saying this. What do we do? And so because the church, because Christ founded the church and gave it authority to act as his body on earth, it also has the ability then to develop doctrine in that way and to say, all right, this is, what, this is, this is the implication we're drawing out, for example, of the, the passage in the book of Maccabees about pray, prayers for the dead, the Jewish tradition of praying for the dead, for that matter. And here's what we, we have, have drawn from that and other sources is the uh, doctrine of purgatory. And we can see the continuity, even though that word is not explicitly invoked. We could also say that about the Holy Trinity. You won't find the word Trinity in the New Testament, and yet the doctrine is there. If you, you, know, you, you read, I mean, it's pretty clear, actually, that, you know, that the doctrine of the Trinity is there, but how it gets formalized is how the church exercises its authority to teach and then passes on you know, what uh, is revealed, right, uh, in their... Um, under, the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, right, which guides the church. And so they, we, have a living, we have a living tradition. It's, it's a, a, like a, a, a great tree that continues to grow and put out branches, and, but is nevertheless, you can trace it to the same roots that have always been there. The, the contrary to this would be what is sometimes called primitivism, right? And this was kind of the ideal of a, a certain type, certain Protestant churches, not all. Like Anglicanism, it would not necessarily, I guess low church Anglicanism might be in this category. But quite a few Protestant churches, the idea is that, well, you figure out exactly what the early church was doing. And by early church, we mean like, you know, the first century, maybe the second. Uh, some people will allow it all the way to the fourth century and say that's when things went off course, right? But people, have, you know, have a different idea of what the primitive church was, and we need to line it up exactly with what they were doing then to be authentic. And anything that does not reflect that needs to be removed. Again, like barnacles on a ship. Scrape it off, make it look like it looked in the first century. But that doesn't assume a living reality, uh, reality right? like an organic body that can grow mature over the centuries but while still remaining itself, just like we do, as growing uh, living human beings. And so primitivism kind of has this idea, which again is not itself supported in Scripture, right, that the way the church looked in the first hundred years is the way it has to look always and forever. And by the way, the church in the first hundred years also changed, right? So it'd be kind of hard to freeze it even within that time frame because a hundred years is time for things to begin to, to, to grow, right? You read the Didache, right? They're putting together an order of worship which changes over time, right? So in the Catholic Church, primitivism isn't it, but that doesn't mean, of course, that looking at what the early church did doesn't still provide inspiration, and maybe doesn't help us to recover an early zeal in the church that can indeed wane over the centuries. This is one of the themes of Vatican II, right? It was, yes, looking to the early church, we can see uh, maybe something that we've lost sight of, right? So we're, we're always looking to that, but also understanding that we, we're, that we are, what we are reflects the long journey between then and now. So I'll talk a little about, bit about tradition in our lives. We'll probably have a little time for a Q&A before we do the table discussions. Is that the way we're normally doing it? Okay. And so just to kind of give you a, a sense of you know, how, how tradition plays out richly within Catholic liturgy and Catholic life, uh, we just throw out a few things. Maybe some of them uh, you have experienced and noticed already. And so uh, one thing we start out with every time we meet here is the tradition of prayer. Lexia Divina has come up a lot like tonight, right? The uh, different ways, I mean, if you start to look at, as you will, 
the different traditions of prayer in the Catholic Church, I mean, you might either feel like a kid in the candy store or you might just feel overwhelmed because there's just so much, right? You can have Ignatian spirituality, you can have Franciscan spirituality, you can have you know, Dominican or, I mean, it goes on and on, right? Different ways of praying that resonate with different people, right? People kind of sometimes find their groove. And so it's all there to be explored. And, you know, if you are somebody who uh, tends towards a, you know, visual, um, you know, visual thinking, Lexio Divina is really great because it encourages the imagination. You put yourself in the scene, right? Uh, others maybe crave more silence. Just allow your mind to be still without thinking of anything in particular in the presence of God. Contemplative prayer follows that path. Right, so that's one way in which uh, we have a tradition that is very much alive for people. And people are often exploring different ways. And now it's easier than it's ever been because for every tradition you can name, there's an app, all right? <laughs> or there's one app that has all of them within it. So it's pretty easy to figure out, you know, does this work for me or does it not? And if it doesn't, that's fine, right? We're, not, we're, we're all different. Other uh, things, adoration. So I've, here I have, of course, the image of the monstrance uh, with the... Um, the Blessed Sacrament in the Blessed Sacrament, the, the consecrated host for communion, right? So monstrous, it just means, comes, it's related to the word demonstrate, right, to show. So you put the Blessed Sacrament to show in the monstrance, right? Uh, uh, demonstrative, right? You, okay. And so um, we have the Adoration Chapel right over here. There's a code that you put in the door to go in, but people are there 24 hours a day. And this goes back, you know, uh, this was also a development. The, you know, the first few centuries, you didn't have Eucharistic adoration, but there comes to be over time an appreciation for the belief, well, Christ is really present in the flesh, in the Eucharist. And for a while, there would be a tabernacle that would wish the Blessed Sacrament was reserved mainly for communion for the homebound. But over time, people begin to develop the practice of praying in front of that tabernacle because Christ is there in a really special way. Yeah, Christ is everywhere, but he's here, it's just a you know, prolongation of his incarnation, right? He's there physically. And so you have developed over time Eucharist, uh, Eucharistic adoration, Eucharistic processions. Uh, I, I studied um, uh, Spanish as a second language down in Guatemala, and I got there just as Corpus Christi season was in high gear because there's like a whole season for Corpus Christi like we have for Christmas and there were processions everywhere, and all these elaborate floral carpets would be laid down in the streets, and it was, it was, it was incredible, right? It, the Corpus Christi Mass, right? People following the Blessed Sacrament, I mean, long, long lines of people through the streets. And you see this throughout Europe as well. In fact, this summer, I was in a Eucharistic procession in Austria, where they've been doing this for centuries. And they had me wearing vestments that have been around for centuries, you know, which made me think, I've gotta be really careful here, right? But it, it was incredible. Again, this is a beautiful tradition that what does it do? What is it, it, well, it heightens our faith in the Eucharist, right? And therefore, it's in continuity with and deepens what the church has taught. Go back to the Didache. What were they doing? They were breaking bread, and they understood it was the body of Christ. Saints, uh, you know, I mean, we'll talk about that in more detail because that's, a, that's obviously a big issue, just like the Eucharist will have its own day. But there again, you see the living nature of the church because the saints are not, there isn't a point in time where, you know, you can draw the line and say, well, the saints existed up to this point and now they're kind of, you know, they're in stained glass kind of safely in the past. Saints are being canonized a lot, right? Including, you know, the, recently the, uh, this kid from Italy that was beatified, Acutis, right? He's like, looks like any kid that you'd see in a modern city, you know, computer whiz. He exemplified holiness. He's somebody who now we look to, uh, in his case, uh, to deepen our belief in the Eucharist, because that was his calling, was to, be, you raise, to make people aware of Christ in the Eucharist. Someone that is even closer to home than that, he was from, uh, from Italy, from uh, Milan. Someone closer to home would be uh, Blessed Stanley Rother, who was from Oklahoma. In fact, the, the bishop uh, was instrumental in getting his calls before Rome, getting his beatification through, who speaking of Guatemala, uh, was a missionary down there in a small village on Lake Atitlan. And uh, he was there at a time of civil war. 
when there was intense persecution of Catholics, right? Especially those who were seen as allying with the peasants against the ruling class, right? And so this priest's name, Rother, guy from Oklahoma, grew up on a farm, just not far from Oklahoma City, ends up on a death list. And he comes home, and his bishop says, well, you don't, you don't have to go back. We'll find you a parish here. If you go back, they're going to kill you. And he said, well, no, I can't, I can't desert my flock while it's being attacked by wolves. He went back. Sure enough, he was killed. Uh, and uh, is now recognized as a martyr. Right? These are people who are close to us in time. The bishop met him. You know? So the saints, they, they are they're part of how we see the, the, the church lives. Right? It produces holy people throughout the ages, and they all stand as examples of what we're called to be. Right? I, and uh, you know, it's, it's an exciting thing. I mean, I got to go to this beatification, by the way. If you could ever go to a beatification or canonization, go. It was incredible. I mean, it's just a beautiful, beautiful liturgy. Uh, so, so, so inspiring. Like, his, his sister was there. Like, here's a man who's on the road to sainthood, and there's his sister. How often do you see that in life? You know, it was, it was amazing. I've already talked about this. So one reason I never do PowerPoints is I just get ahead of myself anyway, so it doesn't even work. <laughs> but scripture interpreted in light of tradition. Okay, well, you know, kind of, kind of stole my own thunder on that one. Uh, and then traditions judged in light of scripture. I didn't go into that as much, but we can see how it works both ways, right? That, and I, I guess I kind of did go into that. Like when traditions develop, is it in keeping with the scripture? If not, then that's when... Um, when we can see we might have a problem. Like, uh, an example of this, I guess, would be certain types of syncretism, you know, where the Catholic Church definitely has a tradition of, when it evangelizes, kind of using the pre-existing culture as a tool of evangelization. I mean, how do you think we got Christmas trees, right? And so there are things that, that might exist already in cultures that can be, as it were, baptized and remade or repurposed as tools for teaching the gospel. But sometimes you can end up with what's called syncretism where those things don't gel. And people kind of can hold things that are incompatible uh, that may be from a previous uh, non-Christian tradition. And you know, that, that's where you would have to say, okay, well, this doesn't really, this doesn't fit. In fact, it's undermining the teaching of the church. And so something here has to be done. You know? And so part, certain parts of the world, that, that can be a real issue and it can be uh, difficult. Uh, but uh, very often... Uh, things are kept. You know, when I was growing up, I remember there were kids in my school who weren't allowed to have Christmas trees because that was pagan, right? And we, we weren't that strict. But, you know, that, that can, you, know, you can understand that, that that was indeed brought in uh, from outside, but has been thoroughly Christianized as we understand it now, that the angel at the top and, and so on. But you never get to the end of this. I mean, the thing, the thing I love most about the Catholic tradition is, like I said, I came from a pretty short one, and I'm not saying that to, to you know, jab, you know, to make... Uh, I don't know, to denigrate or anything, uh, the tradition I grew up in. I mean, it gave me many wonderful things. I think chief among them, uh, a you know, reverence for scripture and prayer. But when you suddenly throw open the door and there's 2,000 years stretching ahead of you <laughs> or behind you, however, going all the way back to scripture, you realize, I'll spend my whole life exploring this and never get to the end. And that's a pretty amazing thing. All right, so what you're doing, where you are right now in RCIA, you're at the beginning of what I think is a wonderful adventure. And there's so much to offer, and I hope that you get a really good taste of it, a good sampling of it in the weeks that are ahead.